Amen. Thank you so much. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. We're so glad you're worshiping with us on this Lord's Day, World Communion Day. If you haven't filled out those uh, pew pads, we appreciate if you do that at this time. Mission trip opportunity, see Mike Brown. If you're interested in that, you can also read about it in your bulletin. Harvest Festival, see Desiree or read your bulletin to see what all is going on. I know they still need volunteers and uh, donations. Then we've got Operation Christmas Child. There'll be, yes, okay. Um, Maggie will have some more about that in a little bit. Handbells. If you, first practice next week after the second service they're having uh, food uh, Ruth Chris is catering in um, so so raise your hand if you yeah okay all right our psalm for this morning 91 a thousand may fall at your side 10,000 at your right hand but it will not come near you I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their heads, hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Our Lord God, we are indeed thankful for our salvation this morning, thankful for World Communion Sunday and all that that entails. We're grateful to gather as a family of Christ. We ask that you bless our worship this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now our, holy, our invitation to Holy Communion with pardon, confession. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Please stand and join us for a hymn of praise.
and while they're coming, I meant to let you know that they're, uh, they'll have these tickets for the chili cook-off in the Narthex Will after the service. Yes. <clears throat> This. I want y'all to come a little closer. Come on. I'm going to need you all to help me here. First of all, I want to tell you a little story about Lola. Lola was, lived in an orphanage. She was a very lone little girl until one day she received a shoebox. And in that shoebox, she got a little zebra and she got a letter. And she carried it around until she became an adult and now she's a teacher somewhere out in the Midwest here in the United States but she lived in Africa but now she's a teacher here in the United States and there are so many of these children that have received shoe boxes all over the world that are now either artists teachers nurses doctors they just felt the love of Jesus Christ just a second they felt the love of Jesus Christ and they received a shoe box, and they also received a book after they got the shoe box called A Greatest Journey. And that greatest journey was to learn about Jesus. And in the letter, this is something like what she got. It says, hello, I want you to know that God loves you very much. I hope you all enjoyed all the items in the shoe box. Pick these items just for you. I am praying for you. Love, and then the person's name. Well, that's what we're doing here. On October the 30th, we're going to have a, shoe uh, a packing party, and we're going to pack 150 boxes. Well, we've already got the boxes ready, thanks to the Boy Scouts that was here Tuesday night. They fixed all the boxes up and put the labels on them, so we, all we have to do is pack them. Well, she, j she not just only got this, but she got her school supplies, and she got everything she needed or, or possibly needed. Anyway... She got a doll. If somebody will hold this open, I'm going to unpack this shoebox. Can you hold this for me, Luke? My birthday boy. There you go. She got what meant a lot to her, and she still has this, by the way, a zebra. The doll I do not know about. My shoebox has a maraca. They say they love to hear noises, so it's got a little... Morocco. This one's for an older child, so it's going to be a, some hygiene deodorant. She got beads, a bowl and a cup, so she can use for her food. She got her soap and her towel or her washcloth. She got crayons for her school supplies. She actually got a pencil bag with her pencils, her glue sticks, her Sharpeners are in her scissors. We've got a little backpack in here for her, and we've also got hairbrush, and we've got little hair pieces that she can put in her hair, and I've got those on the hairbrush. And there's much, much more in here, so you can put a lot in here. And there's actually something I love. This is a harmonica, so she can play music. So there's going to be a lot of stuff for this little girl. And then there's one other thing. I always pray over the box and ask God to give me an idea of what this child may want. And, and one little girl wished for a, asked for, or wished for a uh, water paint set, just, you know, like the little paint sets that you can dip your water in and get color. She did coloring paints, I think that's what it's called. Anyway, she is now an artist in California. So, I mean, these children, you don't know what these shoebox is going to do for them, but somehow it means a lot to them. And they are recipients of these shoe boxes. Now they're paying it forward as adults to other children that are orphans or maybe in other countries that don't have anything. So even though you may think one shoe box, it may mean a lot to these children. So let's pray over these shoe boxes. By the way, we're doing 150 October the 30th after at 2 o'clock on a Sunday. And we've already got 98. Uh, uh, donated to uh, people have put their signed up for so we've got 248 boxes that we already know that we're going to give so if there's still about 50 more boxes and that's all we've got this year so anyway 
We want to pray over these shoe boxes, and we want to pray over these children, and we want to pray over Lola, okay? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Lola. We thank you for bringing her to Operation Christmas Child and helping her to become a school teacher or helping her along the way to become a school teacher. Lord, you know what each one of these children need. You know what they desire, but you know what they need. Lord, we ask for your guidance in, in, in packing these boxes. We ask that you help us to know what to write to these children and let them know that you love them and that we love them. And, Lord, we thank you for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Meg. We'll head on into prayer at this time. If you are unable to place your prayer concern in the basket, you can raise your hand uh, right now and share your concern or perhaps something uh, nice happened in your life you'd like to share. Monty? Yeah, we're going to the pumpkin Monty is going to a pumpkin fest with, a fest with his new friend. Someone else. Yes. Sandy Hall's husband has COVID. Yes. Okay, will do. Uh, speaking of uh, the residents who were in harm's way for the hurricane, I uh, got word from Lori Dissel this morning. She believes her sister uh, lost um, their home. So be in prayer for them. Um, someone else? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Jim Dolores Ward, Jim's sister. Okay. Yes, someone else. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are um, heartbroken over um, what's transpired with the hurricane and all that were uh, dealt harsh realities with that. We're grateful for the miracles that transpired with those who were uh, spared. Um, we are understanding this morning that uh, your watch care is especially uh, needed and hopefully felt by all uh, who are going through all this. We're asking that your will be done with all the concerns that were raised. Um, we ask, Lord, that your will be done with those who uh, will be watching later uh, via YouTube. We're grateful for the love that we all have one for the other. We're grateful that we have a praying church, a giving church, a loving church. We ask now that we uh, do pray together as a family while we're together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory yours, for now and ever.
Don't forget to be in prayer for Jim and Sheila and the baby. They are uh, in Pennsylvania. We had a special prayer for them this morning. Uh, Jim will be traveling back uh, on Tuesday. Uh, if you would, stand and extend a hand of peace to one another for a couple moments. Then, if you want to take a second to get situated. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Before I move forward, I want to just share a couple of things about this passage. A quick quick observation. In most translations, this passage uh, in verse 24 starts out, therefore, thus drawing our attention back to all that Jesus said in the previous two chapters and what we have come to know as the Sermon on the Mount. The therefore sets up his concluding remarks to the sermon. He says, therefore, whoever hears these words of mine. In context, Jesus is referring to the entire sermon, the entire discourse. If you have a Bible that has all of his words in red, he says every word in red as part of that discourse is my word. We tend to pick out and quote our favorite portions of the Sermon on the Mount, but ignore the parts we don't like. We may post our favorite snippets as a Facebook meme or stick a portion on our fridge or embroider a verse and frame it. But some simply lay aside those hard sayings with which it's hard to agree. Here Jesus is calling us to put into action all of what he said. When Jesus connects the word therefore to the phrase, these sayings of mine, He takes away our ability to pick and choose the portions we like and ignore the rest. What he is about to say applies to all his words in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is stressing the relation these words have to himself. They are his and he cannot be separated from them. All right, building on a life or building a life. Several years ago, while serving as and Rhonda knows this story. I spoke of it a few weeks ago. I was serving as Dean of Senior High Assembly at Camp Lucon. The campers were engaged in a high intensity game of capture the flag. Roughly 100 teenagers and counselors vying for one of two flags 
placed at opposite ends of a large predetermined space consisting of a large field, trees, and a trail or two. After the game, we all headed back to the canteen for a break. We had been there for a few minutes when someone shouted an interesting question. It went something like this. Has anyone seen Tyler Glass or Ryan Whiteneck? Evidently, they had not returned with the rest of the campers after the game. In an attempt to outsmart the enemy defenses, they had purposely left a marked trail that would have taken them straight to the enemy flag area and thus gotten themselves lost. I might make mention for safety reasons, leaving the trail was not allowed. A search ensued and eventually Tyler and Ryan walked out of the woods having found their way back. Tyler was teary eyed, visibly shaken, and his legs were really torn up from running through the woods in the thicket. There are conflicting accounts as to how long they were lost. Those of us who were there contend they were lost somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour and a half. Tyler recounts that they were gone for several days. <laughs> he contends that they lived off the land and erected a shelter made out of wild animal skins. He remembers exiting the woods sporting a coon skin cap and a slain deer thrown over his shoulder. All kidding aside, Tyler was 12 years old. And it was a scary and painful experience for him and for me. But it didn't have to happen that way had he simply stayed on the path and that took him straight to where he needed to go. In straying from the trail, Tyler was attempting to defy an important principle you and I have discussed before. More on that in a second. First, what is a principle? A principle is not a rule one follows. Actually, principles follow us everywhere we go, even when we're not aware of them. A principle is not something one chooses to apply. A principle applies itself to us, even when we're not aware about it, aware of it. A principle is not a law or a rule we can break. However, if we ignore certain principles, they may break us. Consider Isaac Newton best known for the idea that every object in the universe attracts every other object such that force, the force exerted will be proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Basically, if I drop this Bible, what's going to happen? It's going to fall. What's that called? Gravity. The law or the principle of gravity. How many of you all remember a young man named Archimedes? And I don't mean like you were there. You just remember... <laughs> Oh, yeah, he lived right down the street. The most widely known anecdote about Archimedes speaks to how he invented a method for determining the volume of an object with an irregular shape. The story goes that a crown had been made for a king who had supplied the pure gold to be used. Archimedes was asked to determine whether some silver had been substituted by a dishonest goldsmith. Archimedes had to solve the problem without damaging the crown, so he couldn't melt it down into a regularly shaped body in order to calculate the density. Archimedes noticed while taking a bath that the level of the water in the tub rose when he got in. He realized that this effect could be used to determine the crown's volume. The submerged crown would displace an amount of water equal to its own volume. By dividing the mass of the crown by the volume of the water displaced, the density of the crown could be obtained. This density would be lower than that of gold if cheaper and less dense metals had been added. The test on the crown was conducted successfully, proving that silver had indeed been mixed in. Today, we experience Archimedes' principle when we step into a swimming pool, when we throw a stone into a pond, when I was standing atop an aircraft carrier in the ocean during the 80s. Buoyancy and gravity two immutable, unchanging principles. Irrespective of how I feel or believe about Archimedes' principle, a rock is still going to sink and a raft is still going to float. Principles are not something we can invent or make up. While Archimedes discovered the principle of buoyancy in the fifth century, it's pretty much always been there. I can recall my last day of being a lifeguard at Wyandotte Park I was a senior in high school. 
I was sitting up in my chair at the deep end when a kid jumped off the high dive and subsequently went straight to the bottom. I jumped in and pulled him out. While walking to the first aid office, the child proceeded to tell me that he couldn't swim, not even a little bit. I had watched him as he confidently walked up the ladder to the diving board, strut across the board and dive in. One would imagine that he saw this all going much differently. Once he smacked into the reality of 10 feet of water, he immediately realized he had chosen the wrong path. Principles, by and large, can't be defied, regardless as to what we believe about them. When Tyler left that trail, his destination changed, demonstrating a non-negotiable principle, one we have discussed before. Andy Stanley calls it the principle of the path, and it goes like this. One, or our direction, determines our destination, not our intention. This principle is as unchanging and as immutable as gravity. I cannot get on 64 heading west and get to Frankfurt. It doesn't matter if I've called family in Frankfurt and said I'm on my way. If I'm packed, if I've prayed about it, nothing's going to get me to Frankfurt if I'm on 64 heading west. There's little doubt in my mind that Tyler felt his plan to sneak through the woods was foolproof. But his intent, his feelings, his belief had no bearing on the eventual outcome. It didn't matter how clever Tyler thought he had been. It didn't matter how long it had taken him to make his plan to dupe the other team by channeling his inner Rambo. Leaving the path would deny him his destination. And in the meantime, create a lot of worry, heartache, and physical pain. It happens to all of us in varying forms, in myriad ways, and for all kinds of reasons. We think we know best, yet we lose our way from time to time, and oftentimes it's avoidable. And if you've ever been lost, you know that there are three things that are always true about being lost. First of all, we never get lost on purpose. Secondly, we normally are lost before we know we're lost. Obviously, we would change things earlier if we knew earlier on. I know my wife would be much appreciative of that fact. We always end up where the road we are on takes us. It's, it's undeniable. It's indisputable. It's non-negotiable. We're going to go in the direction we're headed. Where we intended to end up is irrelevant. For us to say, but this isn't where I want it to be, doesn't change the current reality. By then, it's too late. If we're on the wrong road, it doesn't matter what we believe, what we hope, what we pray, what we dream, or what we think, we're still lost. We see shiny objects and we take wrong turns, financially, relationally, with regards to our health, spiritually, and on and on. Another way to look at it is this. With every decision we make, we are either, either building our house on a rock or building our house on sand. To appreciate this parable, one needs to understand a little bit about the terrain of Palestine. I've been there. Jim's been there. It's covered with hills and valleys. And it doesn't rain consistently like it does here. Four or five times throughout the course of the winter and spring months, these huge um, torrential downpours come, these storms this causes peaceful streams to become raging streams and carry everything in its path with it. This leaves a sandy deposit in the lowlands. The wise man will not, beat, or will not build in the sand. He chooses to build in the higher country where there is solid rock. And it's a great deal more difficult to build there. Have you ever read the term or heard the term city on a hill? Right? Light on a hill? Well, the seas on the hill are, are, are built there for this reason, and also there isn't much rain. There isn't a lot of agricultural land in Israel. So they have to use all that flat land for agriculture, so they put their towns, or they put their towns on hills way back in the day. In our passage this morning, the concluding words of our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays out the principle of the path in a different way. He says, everyone who hears these words, the words I just shared on this hillside, and does them will be like the man, the wise man who built his house 
on the rock. He's saying this, these words share or bear out the words in which I'm saying this is how you should live your life as a Christian. He speaks, during this discourse, he speaks to the importance of humility, being teachable, hungry and thirsting for righteousness, being merciful, forgiving, pure in heart, makers of peace, mourning over our sin, prayer, witness, no need for worry, forgiveness, on and on and on. With that, each and every day is filled with decisions we make, large and small. We are building a life. And we are building it using the building blocks composed of those decisions, large and small. Each decision is built on sand or rock. And each step brings with it a choice. That's why it's vitally important that we slow down. We live at a breakneck pace. We're busy. We're, we're working multiple jobs. We've got all kinds of stressors. We've got to slow down because each decision is important. Dallas Willard says, step number one in discipleship is to eliminate hurry from our lives. Eliminate hurry from our lives. The foundation with which we choose to build determines how things go when the storms roll in. When we think about the residents who were in the path of Hurricane Ian, sadly, it will take years and years for some of them to rebuild, and some won't be able to rebuild at all. When we build our lives poorly, apart from the obedience to the tenets of Jesus, we can end up in the midst of storms that will take a long time from which to recover. And some of those storms we brought about ourselves. So, Daryl, how do we do it? How do we make the kinds of decisions to where our house is built on the rock? Well, I've got some things for your consideration this morning. First, there needs to be a consistent self-examination, self-reflection, and prayer. And dare I add, silence and solitude. Most of you know I wake up 4 o'clock every weekday. I have a very difficult time functioning if I don't. So I pretty much get up every morning without fail. Several weeks ago, um, we, we ordered a... Um, wedge that goes under our bed and it's a wedge that goes to a seven inch incline so for several nights and still i slide down the bed <laughs> and i'm like free soloing trying to get up and sometimes i'm hanging on like wally coyote in a cartoon fashion just trying to stay up at the top of the bed so for several nights I wasn't sleeping very well, and I would get like one or two hours sleep, but at four o'clock, I knew I had to get up. I knew I had to make that time, and because this is what I know, and this is important, I won't just drift in good directions. I must discipline and prioritize myself there. I'm not just going to naturally drift into good directions. I've got to prioritize and discipline myself there. With that in mind, we need to continually check our reference points. Here's a picture to make that point. Everyone here has heard me tell the story. I won't tell the story. But this is a picture of what one of the things I had to do in flight school. And what happens is, you know, I'll just real quickly, you go all the way under and you see the blackened goggles so you can't see what's going on to simulate crashing at night. When the water, when the whole thing fills up, you're totally immersed. You are to, he's, he's, he's cheating, actually. If you see his left hand, once you get immersed, you count to five, and then you grab your reference point. He's grabbing his reference point. That way, when he unbuckles and he goes to leave, he knows the direction in which he is to take. If you let go of your reference point, and I saw this waiting in line for, to do my part, people are just floating without a direction. And sometimes the diver would have to come down and take them by the hand or the scruff of the uh, flight suit or whatever and pull them out the door, pull them out the window. I have reference points in my life. The Sermon on the Mount is my go-to reference point because I know in the Sermon on the Mount I can find everything that Jesus wants of me. 
discipleship-wise. Of late, I've been doing some brushing up on Wesleyan history, and it's my impression that it was one of John Wesley's reference points, the, part, the Sermon on the Mount. My formation with my Franciscan brothers and sisters is a reference point for me. These are spiritual reference points. Silence is a reference point for me. I am alone for at least two and a half hours between 4 o'clock and 7.30, and sometimes a little bit longer. Like Friday or Thursday was a conference day for me, so I didn't have to be there. I could even wait until 8 o'clock to go in, but I still got up at 4 because I knew that I had to have that time. Remember that our paths in life are obvious if we choose to see them. The trail Tyler was on was clearly marked. He simply thought he knew a better way. Each day presents us with fresh choices. We are constantly building a life with those choices. Often others can see that we have strayed from a path sooner and more clearly than we can. Those of you who are teachers, especially high school teachers who are here, we see kids all the time who talk about doing well and doing the best they can and turning the corner and turning over a new leaf and all those kinds of things. And that they're intent to do so. But as a teacher, we can watch them barreling right in the direction that they don't want to go. They think they are, they want to, their intent, but their intent, their intention isn't going to get them to their destination, only their direction. We all know that person who shares their shock and dismay over a girlfriend or a boyfriend who just broke up with them. They're shocked, they're surprised, they can't believe it. But how many of you ever <laughs> known that to happen? You're like, dude, I knew that five months ago, right? We're watching the path that they're on, but they don't realize it because their intentions are elsewhere. And they're like, that ain't happening. That's not going to last very long. I see it all the time on the street, all the time on the street. The intent is there, the want to is there, but they travel down paths that lead them away from their intended goals. Case in point, my dear friend Hollywood, met him several years ago, was afraid of him actually at the beginning because he's a very imposing figure and we got to know each other the last year or so. I got to know about his daughters. We sat and he loved the dog he had and we got very close. And he kept telling me, yeah, I've gone straight, I'm doing this. He was so intent. And about six weeks ago, someone took his life down on Melwood under the underpass because he was not on the path that he thought he was on. We have to be honest with ourselves about the decisions we make. What's the real reason I'm doing this or that? What's my motive? There's, here's the question. Is this a wise thing to do? Is this going to get me where I need to be? Is this going to lead me in a direction that I need to go? What's this decision going to mean a day from now, a week from now, months from now, years from now? Don't be afraid to change direction. Sometimes that's direction, that direction change may need to be a repentant, complete about face, an about face from the direction you're going in. And I've mentioned this as a teacher. High school teachers, again, maybe even middle school teachers, obviously. Sometimes I've caught myself over the years, I've been doing this for 25 years, and it doesn't happen very often. But I catch myself in a conflict with a student. One of those, well, I did not. Well, yeah, you did. I saw. You know, I didn't. Those kinds of things. And then internally, there's that moment when I say to myself, Daryl, this is your fault. You set him up for failure, and you're arguing back and forth because of something you did. And I've got to step back and swallow my pride in front of 20 other teenagers some of whom would like nothing better to see their teacher be wrong and say, I was wrong. I headed down a path that led me to a destination that neither of us wanted to go. I'm sorry, can we start over? Be careful that you don't think you are the exception. Don't think to yourself, I know others have traveled this path and failed, but I can do it. A few years ago, 
I felt that ingesting a large bag of candy corn every other day was going to lead to optimum health. <laughs> While I was traveling merrily down candy corn lane, my destination ended up being a major heart attack. Many of us tend to think we have problems in life that need to be fixed. Car needs to be fixed. My computer needs to be fixed. My phone needs to be fixed. I've got some plumbing that's gone bad. I need someone to come fix it. These are things that can be fixed. We're a lot more complex than that. Normally, we don't have problems that need to be fixed. We just need to go in a different direction. I used to do some counseling I don't do it now because there's just, it's just so time consuming. But I do premarital counseling, obviously, because I officiate weddings. And invariably, a couple would come to me and they're like, what can we do? What, how, how can we fix this? What's the fix? And they would be looking for that fix, that one statement that I could give them. Oh, okay. All you need to do is turn the knob to the right. No. I had to somehow, in a clear way, explain to them, it's not a quick fix. You can't turn an aircraft carrier around on a dime. You've got to change direction, and it's going to take time, and it's going to take effort, and it's going to take you wanting to do it. I can't fix you, and you can't fix yourself. You've got to make up your mind that you're just, you're making decisions that's sending you in a path that's leading you where you don't want to go. Problems can't, be always, can't always be fixed, but they can be avoided. The direction we're currently traveling, relationally, financially, spiritually, and the list goes on, will determine where we end up in each of those respective areas. But we've got to be teachable. I preached a whole sermon on this last year. This is a big one for me. This is so big for me. I am constantly reminding myself how very limited my knowledge is about so many things. We can't continue thinking that our limited life experiences have prepared us for all the complexities of life. It just hasn't. I consider myself a fairly educated person. I graduated from an ultra-conservative Bible college where my Bibles were so marked up that I just had to place my shelf because they become unreadable. Then I attended a progressive seminary. I spent five years in the Navy. I've been all over the world. And yet each morning, I wake up a beginner. The more I learn, the more I realize, the less I know. I'm, I'm doing a sacred ground course with my Franciscan friends, and it's a very in-depth course on racism. We studied indigenous tribes and, and slavery and all these things in just crazy depth. We're reading different books, we're reading different articles, watching different uh, videos, and I spend, I've been spending a lot of my time remorseful and humbled because there's so much, not only did I did not know, but so much I still don't know. Life humbles me. My teenagers humble me. My mistakes humble me. Think about this passage regarding this point. I read dozens of sermons and commentary takes. And there are diverse understandings of the text. And that's how it works. They taught me in seminary one interpretation, many applications. Well, if you do enough studying and reading, you'll find out that pa all pastors and theologians didn't get that memo. A lot of pastors and theologians think differently. Scholars think differently about this passage. Some see it as salvific. They don't even see it as pragmatic.
Proverbs 19.20, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Proverbs 18, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Many of you are aware of what's going on in the United Methodist Church. Some of you aren't. For the last few months, I've watched over 50 YouTubes, some of them two and a half hours in length. I've watched town halls, I've watched lectures, I've watched question and answers, I've watched UMC history, I've watched every take by every perspective, by every kind of person. I've studied up on Wesleyan history and I've been reading the Book of Discipline. Don't ever do that. It is some dry stuff, I'm joking. I would encourage you to do it. It's worth it in the end. But, but Daryl, why? Why are you doing all that? Because I want to learn. And more importantly, I need to learn. When I first started looking at YouTubes as algorithms are, it would keep sending me YouTubes that tend to believe in, in how I believe, or was believing at the time. And I know better. And I said, oh, no, you don't. So I made sure that I looked up, up another two dozen YouTubes and articles that was 180 out from my thinking. And there are loving caring, scholarly persons sharing all perspectives. And for me to make any kind of decision to come down on one side or whatever and to only listen to the folks who agree with me, in fact, I've changed my mind on some of the issues. And that would never happen if I just read, watched, listened to people who line up with me, agree with me, who fit my narrative. We need to be humble and teachable. Consider your life this morning. What kinds of materials are you using to build your life? What kinds of decisions are you making to build upon your foundation. If you continue on your current course, where will you end up? Because here's the truth. Nobody gets around the principle of the path. Can't do it. It's a principle. It's immutable. It's unchanging. We cannot mature spiritually on a path of spiritual neglect. We cannot reach financial stability on a path of reckless spending, and on and on and on. The principle of the path reminds us to be wise and clear-eyed about our daily habits. None of our choices take place in a vacuum. Every single decision we make determines who we are becoming. Every single step is in a particular direction on a particular path, so the question we must ask ourselves this morning, where do I want to go? And I am I on the path that will take me there. I was talking to the teenagers this morning. Are we building our life on the rock? In 1 Corinthians, Paul says that our foundation is Jesus Christ, and we must be careful to use the material or what kind of materials we use from which to build. One final thing. I'm closing. The entire time Tyler was lost, he was getting all cut up on his legs. He was worried. He was afraid, thick, thick wooded area. It's a big place. Lucon's 1,500 acres. The whole time he was dealing with his mistake and definitely trying to find his way back. There was a dad who was concerned and worried and loved him, couldn't wait for him to get back. I wasn't consumed or even thinking at all about the fact that he got off the trail, that he had disobeyed, that he had run afoul of the rules. I just wanted him home. 
I just wanted him back. That's how God works. He knows that we make wrong turns. He knows that we choose poor paths. He knows that we go in poor directions. But he's always there when we come back. And just like the prodigal father, he was looking in the direction in which his son was coming, and then he threw a party for him. I mentioned reference points. This is a reference point for all of Christianity. If you'll take out your elements, the elements. Jim has already uh, consecrated the elements, so all I'll need to do is say a prayer over them. This is world. Anyone need the elements? Raise your hand, and Sheila will, uh, Sylvia will come to where you are. Go back, go and get some money. It is World Communion Sunday. That means this is a reference point for everyone celebrating all around the planet. Some have already taken theirs, some will take theirs later, and some are taking them right at this moment all around the world. If you would, take the bread. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for the consecration of the elements. We're thankful for the love that Jim has for this church. We're thankful for the love you had and have for us. We ask as we ingest the elements that you, uh, as we take part in this symbol of the body of Christ, that you bless this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. We look at the juice and we thank Jesus Christ for all that comes as a part of the blood of Christ covering our sins. We ask that he bless this moment in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we'll have our closing hymn. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. Be safe.